So, uh, my name is Ahmad Mohsin, and I'm going to be with you in this, uh, inshallah, good lecture, great lecture um, that uh, Professor uh, Almir Chulan is going to give us today regarding economic crisis and uh, what's happening in the world right now, in the crossroads of the global economic crisis. Uh, Mr. Almir is the director of the Australian Center for Islamic Finance, and I think uh, many, most of us have two interests in this lecture. The first one regarding the economic crisis, because we are in 2023, so uh, I'm suspecting that most of us are suffering from what's happening in the economic scales. So it would be better if we can have like a look what of what's happening globally and how this affects our lives. This is from uh, one angle. The second angle that I, I think most of us are interested in is about Islamic economy and Islamic finance and what can bring to this crisis. Uh, you know, there are, we can say, orthodox views uh, regarding how we are going to manage economic crisis such what we are uh, living right now. Um, but the last 10 years, at least, maybe from 2008 till now, showed that most of these classical orthodox uh, approaches, uh, we can see not effective enough for in dealing with this crisis. So we, uh, we, East and West are searching for alternatives and other views. So I think uh, this uh, lecture bring to us these both sides uh, and I'm not going to make my talk too long, so we are going to give uh, 40 to 40 minutes uh, for the talk, and then we open the floor for Thank you very much. Assalamu alaikum. Uh, thank you very much for inviting me to be here at Shark Forum. Uh, really, m my pleasure knowing um, uh, about these uh, institutions and what it aims to do. And also being here in this, uh, in this uh, beautiful city that connects East and the West, it's, I think, a very, uh, not just beautiful city, but uh, very important in, in many regards. And so it's my particular pleasure to uh, talk to you from this, from this city and also in person to see you and maybe uh, have a little bit of conversation with you. I think uh, these kinds of topics it's, it's a, uh, I'm, I'm looking forward to uh, have a conversation with you after I make some brief remarks and, uh, and then that maybe um, we can think about how this uh, topic relates to us. What is it something that maybe we can uh, personally do? Uh, what, what is within our reach and uh, what, what, what action can each one of us maybe uh, think about doing at the end? Uh, now, the topic itself has got a couple of uh, key words there. One is the crossroad, uh, and then there is a, that big uh, economic, uh, global economic sort of uh, crisis that is unfolding. So, when you think about a crossroad, um, usually when you are traveling uh, and you reach a crossroad, uh, it assumes that you had some sort of a sense of direction, that you are going somewhere until you hit that crossroad. And this is when then uncertainty emerges. And what you usually do at the crossroad is you need to decide from all the different directions, where do I go? And this is when you have a conversation. And I guess this is one of the things probably that uh, Shark Forum is doing, is that it's facilitating insightful and thoughtful conversations about direction of, you know, whether it's a political or economic or social and, and, so, and, and so on. So conversation we are having today is a little bit related to changing nature of our economy. What exactly is the crossroad where we are at? Um, when I started uh, studying economics, I remember one of my professors at university, he was uh, telling us a story and he said, each one of you in the classroom is good at something. And if you want to do everything by yourself, you're not going to be very efficient, very productive. So you better focus on one thing. Like maybe you, you, you like uh, to grow strawberries. 
grow strawberry, you like to make shoes, you make shoes, you like to grow wheat, you grow wheat, you want to build machines, engines, you do that. You don't try to do everything, right? And it made sense. If I try to do all of these things by myself, I won't be so good or efficient. But if I focus all of that energy, I could be more competitive, uh, my product would be cheaper as I reach the scale and so on. So this idea that I could produce something that I'm really good at and then go to other people who are really good at something else and buy cheaper, you know, we are entering this free market economics where, you know, you're getting the best of everything. I'm giving my best service, uh, you, you are getting the win, I'm getting the win, and it's cheap as well, right? So this idea somehow found itself from individual conversation to the more country, and then the era of what we now know as globalization was born, right? Globalization means that we are just living in this global world. Uh, this country produces great strawberry. This country produces great wheat. Why you produce wheat when you are so good in strawberries, right? Just produce strawberries, and we'll do the wheat, and they will do Apple computers, they will do something else. And so what became a most important for the sustaining that consumer lifestyle is as long as I'm getting cheap things from somewhere in the world, doesn't really matter where they are coming from, what's happening, I'm getting stuff cheap, my life is better, and everything is working just fine, right? Now, this idea, unfortunately, uh, run its course now. And we see that uh, there are certain repercussions of this idea. While the idea of you focusing your career on one particular field as an individual makes sense, at the national level, when you do that, it represents strategic and systemic risk. How so? What happens in the war when you are or some pandemic or some issue, and your country is mainly focusing on strawberries and you don't have food. Another country cannot send you wheat, or they don't want to send you wheat. Like Ukraine and Russia that produce 30% of the global wheat, today you have 300 million people who suffer food insecurity because of that. They are not producing. They're not producing something that is of strategic importance for that country. So this notion that I will get something from somewhere that will be cheap assumes that supply channel will be always open and working, right? But what we learned from pandemic is that something that started a little bit before, from 2000, actually, First time we really saw this decoupling of the countries was with the Trump presidency. Because the effect on, on American manufacturing was such that all of the jobs went to China, and when you outsource and want to make everything cheap somewhere else, it destroys your local domestic production. And so we, we seen the Trump introduce strategic attack on China in three uh, ways. One is through the currency, trade, and technology. All right, That was a Steve Bannon plan to attack China, basically to cripple its economic uh, uh, power and to return the glo uh, jobs uh, back to US. Now, not many countries saw this actually happening. But dru during the uh, pandemic, what started happening? I'll give you an example of Australia. As pandemic was, you know, happening and every, everything was shutting down, everybody is going on the Zoom and uh, businesses are uh, no longer working, Australian government started spending a lot of money, stimulus, on people to survive because they're staying home. And I have five kids, right? Suddenly, everybody is at home and they need new computers. The old ones suddenly don't work. <laughs> Uh, they have to have the best camera, you know, it has to be Apple, you know, because the rest is, you know, uh, not real thing. 
uh, iPhones, you know, everything. Like, I suddenly, I, I'm kidding you not, I'm spending $10,000 just to buy stuff on Zoom classes, which most of them are sleeping through anyway. So, so the government is spending, we have our own money, we buying this technology. And I'm checking website, where is it coming from? First of all, it takes weeks and months. It's all coming from China, right? We are in Australia not producing it. I remember once I was looking for a camera for myself. There was no cameras in Melbourne, right? So when the time came that we buy the masks or the gloves, we were producing none of that in, Mel in Australia. Active ingredients for the medicine, all was coming from the China. So when you think about it, me living in Australia, we are shipping to China some mineral, iron ore, basically dirt, raw material, and they are shipping us high-level mobile phones, cameras, electronics, and things like that, making 1,000 times more. And plus, we had shortage of these things. Now, with the vaccine, you have also seen the very similar. Countries basically waiting for vaccine, maybe somebody gives them some charity, expired vaccine or something, they, they can't sustain themselves. So what became very apparent is that it is of strategic importance for a country to secure or produce locally what is of strategic importance for the survival of that country. And so what starts happening is that the world started more thinking that rather than thinking about globalization, we need to start thinking that I need to produce important things locally or in the region. And so we are now entering the phase of something called regionalization. Right? Now, the global collapse of supply lines, okay, uh, was for several reasons. Uh, two primary reasons during the pandemic was that it became uh, more difficult to make things. How do you make things if basically your factory is shutting down? China shut down factory, US shut down factory. In Australia, uh, one of my friends, he's servicing a big uh, ships, you know, that carry minerals. And uh, he was telling me that government shut this business that exports $5 billion minerals to one of the African countries, right? Now imagine the government is losing a billion dollar in taxation that runs your health care and education just from shutting down that business. Now that business is not like your local convenience store that can open the door next door. That business cannot be restarted two years later when, that's a, when that customer of yours finds another supplier, right? And this is what starts happening. So, so the businesses, it was more difficult to do things, and it was more expensive. The raw material is more expensive, right? Look at the war, how it affects the food now. You're talking just about the wheat. So not only are the regions where we grow 30% of the global export of wheat under, in the war, but cost of energy is making transportation, making fertilizers more expensive and increasing the uh, cost of that food, right? So we are suddenly in this uh, game where if you, if you are thinking good for your country, what do you do? You basically are, that's where the crossroad is. How do I respond to this? So how do some countries respond? So you see, when pandemic hit and the wars and tensions and all of these things starts happening, country after country is knocking on the door of IMF, give us the loan, for example. Pakistan just took another billion, right? So what's the plan? We're going to get a billion dollars from IMF. We will use it to buy something that somebody else is making, right? And next year, we, we're not going to have that anymore. We didn't build any capacity, but we have a billion dollar loan that we need to pay interest on. How's that for a strategy? Right? Lebanon. They just, again, they started playing with uh, removing zeros from their uh, exchange rates and playing. And, no, there's no strategy. They, they just want to do something that IMF told them 
to get to the loan. I was watching one uh, African country, the uh, sister was a finance minister, and it was IMF conference, and she was, and people were asking, how are you dealing with financial problem in your country? And basically what she said is, I'm just refinancing my loans with IMF. And everybody was clapping. And IMF said, that's exactly how we need ministers and governments to think. If you have a credit card debt, and I'm asking you, how are you dealing with that? Are you getting better paid job, maybe, to pay it off? Cutting your spend? What are you doing? And your response was, you know what? I have that credit card debt, but guess what I'm doing? I'm refinancing. Refinancing just means you are restructuring and you're going to compound that debt even more. That's not a plan. There is no strategy there. So country after country is now facing, and by the way, IMF even doesn't want to give any more loans to these. Why? Because many of these countries now, they're taking also from China loans. So as there is adversarial relationship between the West and the China, IMF doesn't want to give countries loan because it will be paying off Chinese loans. Right? So what do you do? Sri Lankan president just recently ran away from the country because the country ran out of food. In Lebanon, people are celebrating people who go and break into the banks because banks can't give them any more money. They are celebrated as heroes. If you are a businessman in Lebanon now and you're facing the energy crisis, for example, just electricity, you don't have electricity, you can't run this session at most of the places continuously. You want to bring a generator to, as an entrepreneur to start a business. Well, that cargo must go through the, through the port that was controlled by militia who take the tax. Even if it reaches you, even if you pay, and government has nothing from that, you are competing with a warlord who controls the electricity supply in Europe. The governance and the government is very weak to put any plan. So we are now seeing situation in so many of these countries where they don't have electricity or food or there is a collapse or in debt. Debt is on the rise. Problems, where you, you ask yourself, where do I go from here? One interesting example that I'm looking at the moment is, uh, is uh, here in Turkey, right? Everybody criticized President Erdogan, oh, you, you, know, you didn't understand economics, and everybody's saying you should have raised interest rates to basically uh, fight inflation. And, and he's saying something that no other leader is saying. In fact, the whole world is going one way. The whole world adopted one mindset, and he is going other way. If he was, as they say, opportunistic, and everybody saying, do this, there is an election coming very soon. Why is he not doing what the whole world is saying to do? No one would criticize him. Just increase the interest rates. Let's see if that works or doesn't work. Why are you so insisting on something? And, and the reason they're saying that he's insisting that is because there is some ideology in his head. He can't think. There is no, they want to put it as he does not have an agency to think. It's purely ideological decision. They can't be rational, logical way to break down this decision. But if you look at this economy, you know, I'm, I'm making a little, try to make a little documentary film about it, but if you look at 20 years, what they were able to do, in 20 years, if you look at data, if you look at everything, I know young people, when I speak to them and, and, and we talk about it, they all say inflation, the lira is going down, it's harder to pay the bills, the rent, I get it. It's very difficult, indeed. But if you look at the last 20 years, what this government was able to achieve, number one, they built an uh, industrial base here. Right? What that means, industrial base, is ability to produce things the world-class industrial base. In fact, this country is producing almost everything it needs. Most of the countries produce one or two things. You can close down this country, it will be self-sufficient. Number two, what the, the government has done is they built phenomenal infrastructure. So we are talking about roads, railway line, telecommunication, 
you know, you, to, you, you look at the, from high-speed trains to your um, uh, roads, to your airports, not just hard, but soft infrastructure, servicing that infrastructure and so on. It's top, it's, it's, it, we don't have fast trains in Australia, right? So this puts you at very competitive stage. 2001, Turkey had the fastest growth from G20 nations, 11%. While some other countries were minus seven, nine, Italy had minus nine, right? Just to put it in perspective, the speed of the growth in, in, in economy here, comparing it to Europe, much faster. If you put everything equal on parity, it's a fourth economy in Europe and 11th in the world, and now it's moving to top 10. Sure, you don't feel it when you are in the middle of inflation, right? Although uh, records are breaking, everything seems to be, it's, it's hard to square what is going on. And then there is these monetary policies that, that we see. Why he didn't do this with inflation and interest rate? You see, Turkey recognized in, in about 2018 also that these global supply chains are breaking down, right? And they understood that Somebody will need to fill the void, vacuum that is happening. People don't want any more to export from China. They are decoupling. If you are in Europe, you don't want necessarily to make your things in China anymore. Or they, don't want, they, they want something, like let's say Europe. Europe. Where, what do they want? They want something that is made close by. Not too expensive, close by, easy to deliver. Like uh, one of the... One of the critics of, uh, of, of this government from Euro one of the European countries, I don't want to name it, but he was saying, we have superpower on our doors of Europe. He's trying to be Islamophobic, you know, flame this sort of rhetoric. They are making everything and they can deliver it very fast. How can we compete with that, right? So now if you have this engine that is working for your economy, right, the whole world, and you're trying to fill the gap in the market, Right? You, you can't stop this engine producing, right? So the whole world is shutting down economy. China shut down economy, US shut down economy, Australia, and all other countries. Turkey didn't close down this economy. Because you, you, you have to be, resp you must be counted on. You must be such an economy where we know you're going to be working tomorrow if we are going to invest billions of dollars. You are in the middle of all the supply lines of the world. That's why, if you put it into the context, when they say increase interest rates, he cannot increase interest rates. It's very simple. If you run a business, if your interest rates go up, cost of your money goes up. Your economy slows down. You will have to let go people from the work. You can't, that engine can't work. It's like an oxygen. Money, money flow. Cash flow, if you study accounting, you know. What kills the business is not the business is not good. It's cash flow. You, you close your oxygen, it will kill you. You might be healthy. You cannot stop oxygen. Money cannot be so expensive so that businesses cannot have it anymore. Because in conventional time, it makes sense what they're saying before. When you have everything enough, yeah, sure, increase the cost of money, people have less money to spend, and then the price starts dropping. Right, that makes sense in normal time, but this is a different time. This is the problem on supply side, where we don't have enough things. So to drop the price, you need to make more, right? Rather than make money more expensive, to drop the price, you do it from the other side, from the supply side. You increase that production. Now, one thing that's, that, that's been now acknowledged more and more is put people realizing, on top of that, Australian parliamentary, uh, 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 there was a, uh, what do you call it, uh, committee for economics. A few weeks ago, they put a report and said, increasing interest rates will hurt us, our households. It, it will cause recession, more problem than good. And indeed, if this worked, as they say, why are we all, everybody's having in, uh, inflation? If, I mean, if it is simple as that, 
<laughs> you know, okay, let's put interest rates 50% in Turkey and see everything magically disappear. Doesn't make any sense, right? Also, the speci country specific here, a lot of inflation comes from price gauging, people marking up prices, right? Official rate is less than 10% 10, 10 of the interest rates. How much is the home loan in the bank? Double that, right? So they could go up and down, the banks will just mark it up, or in the, in the supermarkets. As soon as they know you have more money, your minimum wage is more, you can spend more, they, they bump up the price. Nothing economically, is just psychology. And the, and the everyday person, when they see media, negativity, Trump is tweeting he will put the tariffs on the steel from Turkey. You know, there is a coup happening. There is a toxin bombing. There is a PKK. There is... Average person is, is, is hearing this story, economy is going down, and they start selling their lira, buying the other currencies, which, which makes everything work. It's psychological. It's psychological. So what do you do? This, of course, works against you. So he needed to, uh, this country, and this comes to the, you know, when you think about long term, what do I need to do for my country that makes sense? When you build this engine, okay, you need to protect it. You need a policy that will protect it. Previously, even the two strong lira contributed to dollarization of the society. It also contributed, it was artificial, it, it was an old IMF program, by the way, that uh, supported two strong lira with two high interest rates, artificially propped it up, which ended up making imports more cheaper, which de-incentivized local production. So you go to the Turkey market, most of the things when the lira was too strong were from China. You had no reason to make anything. It was cheaper to import. Right? So you build the engine, you protect it with the policy. Now look at the issue of energy that is coming. Europe now is going through the process which Financial Times describe as deindustrialization. Uh, energy crisis is causing, energy crisis actually is the energy is main source of um, what you uh, cost of the any production, right? So in terms of the enemy, you look at Germany. Now they are producing per quarter one million car less because they can't make them. They, they, don't, they don't have a guess. There are some schools in Europe where they are advising students and the factories to wear a blanket in the school. They, can't ha they don't have a heating because the Russia cut down the gas, right? Now, look at Turkey. So you have powerhouses like Germany and the Europe, entire industry being now, they're, they're thinking, where do we outsource it? Where do we take this industry? Somewhere else where there is an abundance of energy. Now look at the Turkey, for example, in terms of the energy, which is the major cost of production and the major cost of account deficit at the moment, right? You have now so much gas that that, that is being discovered, whether it's a, a Mediterranean Sea or you're talking about the Black Sea, uh, that uh, ship, you know, Abdul Hamid that is discovering. You have the new oil, you have nuclear. So you're talking about the major cost of production being energy countries becoming more and more self-sufficient. So with, the, with these three things, Turkey is basically on, on, on the path to become one of the major hubs of energy business and supply supply lines. Now, when when this government stood by its decision, I believe that it did that because in the long run this is the best choice for the people to have strong economy of the future. Short term there is a pain. Economy is about choices. You want to have a short term? Easy. Do this, 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 short term, everything is fine. But if you want a long term benefit, it's hard. In fact, most of the other countries that I mentioned, they go for short term. They, they, they are not doing what, what is hard. But there will be a reckoning, there will be a price to pay in, in long run. In fact, 
I don't know how the other countries will survive next five to ten years, to be honest. What is the plan? How will they do what needs to be done? So I would say when it comes to this um, uh, part of the conversation on the crossroad, this is the discussion. Do you want to go towards the path of independence, long-term strategy, where you will produce what you need, or will you surrender your independence? Because, you see, what my professor didn't understand is that you can learn to make things better, right? You don't need to just do one thing as a society. Sixty years ago, in, uh, uh, late uh, Nejmet Erbakan wanted to make a car. They said, don't, don't make a car, make peaches. You are great at making peaches, right? And what they have done, some people who had interest from importing the uh, cars and selling it here, was that at that time, just to kill that idea, that they slashed the import sale price to the nothing so that these cars could be cheaper here, right? To kill competition. Now, if you don't make things yourself, you never get good, you never get more confident, you never develop a skills. You kill your, your, your ability to progress in the future. So you want to diversify. Yes, or right, grow peaches if you like, but let's also grow the other things. So now you have a Turkey that is producing car like Tesla, sending it uh, telecommunication satellite in the earth. You know, Bayraktar is talking about now space uh, vehicles, what they call these uh, things, drones in space now, rockets, you know. If, he was, if his name was not Seljuk but uh, Elon Musk, everybody would applaud him, you know. Now most people don't realize just their exports are in a billion now. From the very little problem that somebody didn't want them, uh, didn't want to sell them something, predator drone. Okay, we'll make it out. You understand? I mean, to have that confidence as a country, somebody say we're not going to give it to you, and you say you know what? I'm going to make it myself. I mean, that's that's a, that's a game changer. So this is what's happening. I think this confidence from being passive to being active player is 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 something that I think other countries should be learning. And this links to the Islamic economic system or Islamic finance. A lot of time when you look at Islamic world or Islamic finance and economic system, a lot of people are treating it as a charity case, right? I sometimes, I have my friends, they do a zakat, and I say, sometimes you have people treating zakat as it is a pillow of Islam to receive zakat. You understand? <laughs> pillow, zakat, Pillar is about giving. You, you can be Muslim without receiving it. You know? <laughs> uh, when they describe Medina economy, it's all welfare. Like you're talking like it's a, some sort, sort of socialist utopia, welfare. You know what welfare means? It means people can't take care of their needs. Somebody needs to help them, for God's sake. That's not what, what was happening in Medina. In fact, Prophet Salam is coming from Mecca to Medina. Because in Mecca, he was economically boycotted. He couldn't survive. Somebody shut down the economy. Somebody was having upper hand on the economy. So he's coming to Medina. Why? So that somebody can have, again, switch in their hand? No, 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 no. Thank you very much. We will have a switch, an economy in our hand. And that becomes a source of power. Because you see, the point of the market, point of economy, is a couple of things. Number one is you, you create the jobs, right? Number two is you create your services for your community. You know, this camera that we are recording, this shirt that I'm wearing, the desk, the computer, healthcare system. Somebody made that. You don't need to be charity case to benefit. You buy that, makes quality of your life better. So the good running economy or the market creates jobs and creates solutions and creates a third thing very important which is it creates surplus so you can help people who cannot help themselves right and so so medina becomes that now fast forward we were just talking about maps that you have one of the first uh, map of uh, uh, Huarizmi, uh Huarizmi's map just first one right 
that he commissioned uh, Halifa at that time commissioned 60 geographers to make the map of the known world and they, they travel and uh, you know through the trade many countries like Indonesia become Muslims and so on and I often think about that those people who were trading and doing business inspired the world even some countries to totally switch to, to embrace that faith right where is that today if I look objectively even Islamic finance industry or halal industry. Islamic finance is just, I don't want to criticize, a lot of people do a lot of things and it's a great, but where is the main concern? Is this transaction at the end when I buying the house halal or not? Like, is that, is that piece of paper, that's important piece, very, very important. But that's the end of supply line. Halal industry, big reports. Halal food today is, I don't know how many trillion dollars. Okay, what does that mean? That means how much meat we eat. That's, that's what it means. Who is making that? Uh, we, we don't have that in our charts. We just say, this is how much meat we eat. Kebab is good. <laughs> it's halal kebab. <laughs> right. It's important. But when you look at top five export countries in the world that export halal meat, none of them are Muslim countries. Right? Australia, where I come from, is number two. Great. When you go there, whole cities export halal meat, billions of dollars. That's great for Australia. But you cannot have halal or Islamic economy where your main stakeholder, Muslim, is being reduced to consumer. Right? You must be upper hand producing one. You must be originator of the supply chain. Right? You can't have a halal economy where your major brands, companies, don't even believe in that halal. And you are having halal economy because you eat that. Doesn't make sense. And that's how you, by not involving in that production, you lose capacity to develop your skills. Right? And so for halal economy, or Islamic finance, needs to work there together. But that comes from this, both of these come from the same mentality, where we have been a little bit neglecting this production, right? This entrepreneurship. How do we kick off, you know? How do we have this certain environment where we encourage young people, or we have a, a funds, or we have a, you know, if, if, you, if you are Islamic bank, how much of your money goes to actually startups and risky uh, investments and so on. So, so we became a little bit risk averse, okay? And when you become risk averse, you're running away from the risk, you, you, you focus more on, on, on consumption, and that, that's where we see basically that uh, decline. So I would say in my summary, and then I'll open to you, that uh, I guess today, um, when I look what is required in front of us, the job is very, very difficult, right? Uh, I would say that uh, everybody has something to do, some, and we can have a conversation. But I'll give you just one small idea, one small idea. Obviously, Turkish example here for me is a great case study, how to transform a country within a generation. Right? That's number one. It's, it's a great case study. Uh, books can be written about it, these a couple of things that I mentioned. But even as you are young people, think about this. All of you told me you are studying different things and you are in your late 20s, late 20s and so on. I think we need to change a little bit the culture of our society where the number of people who are studying uh, Sh there should be a number, and, and I say five for five, I call it five for five. Five percent of young people should be starting a companies that aim to employ another five, five, five people, right? So think about that. If you have five from all, every hundred group, you study engineering or health or whatever you study, hundred, hundred engineering study, hundred engineers who study, five of them, you see, like Bayraktar, by Kartek, right? How many engineers now it employs? Hundreds, 
People don't dream uh, to go to Google anymore. They dream to go there. That's a mission. There is a, you know. So imagine if you uh, redesign your education system that actually introduce to engineers, let's say, how to run a startup business, how to raise the money, just within those subjects, just few, how to do that. And then 5% of these engineers start an engineering business that employs another five people. So five plus five, right? We are talking about now 30% of the workforce, right? Now, maybe not all of these businesses will be successful, right? But at scale, some of these will fail, some of them will become medium businesses, some of them will be huge businesses, and some of them will be a, 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 a changing businesses, unicorns. You have a couple of unicorns in the last couple of years, a billion dollar uh, uh, startups, right? And so I think if we, if we think about that sort of a culture to embrace that risk, when you analyze all of these successful countries, to embrace the risk, to teach, to, to think about uh, failure, not as something embarrassing, to think about trying, to celebrate that. Uh, I, I think that would be a great, great start for all of these countries. And with that quick summary, I'll open the maybe Q&A for you. Sorry if I went a little bit longer. Okay. I think that talks uh, is very informative and uh, thought-provoking as well. So I'm going to start with the first two questions, and then we can open the floor for others. Um, for me, my main take from the, this talk is production, production, production. Supply side uh, is the side that we should focus on, and production, every country should work more in how it produce uh, its main goods and services. So th this is the, the main take for this. And I think this is actually when we we are taking economies, they start talking that the first topic of the economy is about production. We, we can discuss every to topics later, but we should start first by the production. Okay, but here um, I have two questions. The, the first one is regarding uh, changing from globalization to regionalization. So I see here um, faces I, I'm expecting from Malaysia, Indonesia. So are we saying that Malaysia and Indonesia should integrate more with Australia as these are regions with each other instead of trying to reach to Europe or USA. Also, if you are talking about Arab world, so it's better for the Arab world to focus more in helping each other economically instead of focusing on exporting for, for Europe USA, Canada, and this issue. So I think we, we, we need to elaborate more regarding this regionalization. The second one question is regarding, okay, if, if every country is going to produce its main uh, products and services, and I, I think this, is, this idea becomes uh, good, but it has its own challenges as well, because you, know, you need raw materials from outside and you, you need energy. And in some cases, for manufacturing uh, good goods and services, you need something from outside. So most of the case, those are goods that coming from outside are not here and expensive and need times to be manufactured. So how we are going to deal with this? So this uh, were to my two questions. We can take... Let me answer maybe and then... Okay. I'll... Uh, so, so I think your first question answered by the second one. Okay. <laughs> <laughs> so, so the first one was a, a, a regionalization. Uh, so, so a regionalization means exactly that it means your region. Like I give you example of Turkey, for in instance. So, um, Turkey imports uh, they, they they grow a lot of wheat, but they import a lot of wheat from Russia, not because they need the wheat but because they are exporting a lot of wheat-based products, right? And so this is another term, which is the value chain, value chain. So you, you, you have strategic partnership with certain countries around you. 
where you can easily get the goods and movement happening. And so you create a strategic partnership and that hopefully, you know, when you, when you have a business partnership and, 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 and things of that nature, uh, it also creates better stability for, for a peace, for security as well. Long term, right? And so, so, so you see, much of the world currently is afraid of two kind of or three superpowers uh, taking over the world. But there are a lot of countries, if they were to work together, they could uh, start trading with their own currency, less dependent on some other, let's say, euro or dollar. Uh, they, they could leverage each other. Because if you are a smaller country, you can't do everything. But you need to think, what is the most strategic for me? How do I solve that problem? Like, for example, Qatar. They can't grow everything, all of that. All right? Now, they actually get the food from Australia. The sovereign fund invest in the farms in Australia. They grow and get the food from there. So that's how some countries are dealing. That, but that's too far again. That could have been cut off if there was, a, you know, something happening there. But uh, so the second, uh, second part was... Uh, how do we produce, and that's the answer, how do we produce if we don't have? Well, they have something they can't do. You have something that you cannot do. But the key here is the strategy to be independent, to work together, either yourself or together, as close as you can. So Assalamu alaikum. Can you hear me? Okay, Bismillah ar-Rahman ar-Rahim. My name is Mohamed Boras. I'm uh, Moroccan. My background is, uh, I'm currently actually physics teacher in Istanbul. My background is uh, material science. Mm. Uh, so nothing to do with economy, etc. But just like I'm quite interested in it, so I enjoyed the speech from uh, 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 teacher uh, Almir Kulan. Uh, so maybe I just start to comment on the last thing was mentioned, which is the, about the self self efficient uh, self sufficiency issue, which is like you know regionalization and uh, cutting out the, the dependence economy. So you're gonna depend on your neighbor. So I'm just trying to uh, uh, imagine our case, for example, me as a Moroccan, or even actually in any of our uh, Arabic. Uh, friends here from uh, Arabic countries or even Muslim countries, other Muslim countries. We have a lot of issues with our neighbors, with our uh, borders, with our. We have, we don't have uh, like uh, the 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 privilege to even you know dream to have uh, an indebted an interdependent or regional dependence uh, economy rather than just you know uh, ha have it being flourished. So that's like the challenge, which is I think not an economical challenge, but economy is affected by it, so I'm not sure if, if that maybe can, uh, I mean, you can uh, shade, shade a light on it, so maybe, what can we do, okay? Because we can only work with limited opportunity, and we are here all in Turkey or in Istanbul, because Istanbul offered for us, uh, as you said, like it's, it's uh, where, where civilizations meet, and it op many, many people I know, I, I mean, I didn't never imagine I'm gonna meet, uh, although they are my neighbors or maybe the next country, but I can easily meet them here in Istanbul. So uh, Istanbul has that opportunity that our countries didn't have. So uh, that's maybe, of course, a plus for, for the uh, Turkish economy. But just like, uh, is Turkey doing it only for the, I mean, it's trying to be another China, that's the issue. Or is it an issue? Because it's becoming like the new China or the Chinization of, of Turkey, if I may say. and and. For me as a Muslim or someone who have the ideology or have an ideology and have no issue with Erdogan doing what he's doing because of the ideology. Actually, I would, even if it makes me suffer for the short term and because it's for the ideology and because of the interest, etc., I don't mind him doing it. But is there any mission behind it? Okay, so is there any or, is, or, or the purpose for Turkey just to become another China? So what's next? Okay, that's it export everything to the world, flood the whole uh, world with, with the made in Turkey uh, product. Uh, is that the objective? What's next? So there is still the question there. 
And maybe uh, one idea I heard from uh, Mr. Almil in, I think, one of your videos about the shifting the engine of economy from the industrial or actually from the financial market into the industrial. Because everywhere we see around the world, everyone want to make a quick buck by just investing in, in stocks or maybe in, 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 in currencies or forex or, or just putting the money and getting the money. But no one want to do the work, do, do the, like go to the market or build and, 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 and struggle with it. So Turkey, we can clearly see that it's trying to leave the focus or shift the focus of the economy or nature of the economy into the industrial rather than the financial market. I would love if you can uh, uh, elaborate on that idea uh, uh, much more. And I think uh, that's it for now. So first of all, congratulations to your team on soccer uh, oh, yeah. result. Very good, Morocco. We were all cheering, very disappointed with the loss at the end, but <laughs> pretty good. I was actually uh, watching that game. I was in Istanbul. Uh, was, I found myself on Bosphorus. No, I was in the, in the cafe having a tea, watching the Bosphorus, watching the game. It was very good, but result disappointed a little bit. But, <laughs> but it was good su success, mashallah, for Morocco. Uh, look, the, let, let me put it this way. Uh, Morocco having you know, problems with the neighborhood. Where do you turn if you don't have a neighbors to turn? That means you are in the problem, right? If you don't do it yourself, you cannot rely on neighbors, and everything else is far away. What do you do? You make it the best you can with what you have, right? We can't have utopian ideal solutions. It's not going to happen. So you, you, you work with what you have. You try to build. You, 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 you look at what can I do. You don't want to have this hopelessness attitude. You think about, okay, what can I do? What can I do? What, what is my country good at doing? Let's, 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 let's do something. Let's, let's make something. You're trying to de-risk. You want to put some resilience back in your productive capacity so that you start something, start anything, right? And you build from there. Try to repair those uh, relationships. Uh, Turkey uh, really is, again, master class in di diplomacy. You know, when I look at how they deal with Russia, on one side of the world they are in the conflict, whether it's Syria or Ukraine, on another side they are in the dealing and like, how do you do this? How is this happening? You understand? And then suddenly they are in Libya and making the deal and uh, there is a gas deal in the sea there. And, like, and then this was all in the middle of, uh, surrounded by wars from all directions from Syria to Azerbaijan to Ukraine to internal coups to, you know, the conflicts here and there. So it's not like they are, they are, they are uh, easily handling. But as your economy grow and, you know, the, it funds and strengthens the rest of the government apparatus, you know, uh, uh, you, you make friendships, you make uh, peace deals, you, you focus on stable, being stabilizing country, right? So for Morocco or this country, you, you, you just have to focus on... What can I do with what I have in the neighborhood that I am? The option is not just to say it's bad, what we do. What do you do? Do you just go and take a loan and get stuff somewhere? Also, you see, is Turkey becoming China? Um, I think every country is trying to, uh, to be able to produce something. And, and, and that's, that's very important. Um, you know, we are entering the world that uh, China now is not China of 20 years ago. China used to be the cheap stuff. It's not any more cheap stuff. You know, China now is uh, uh, at the cutting edge of bioengineering, you know. Uh, uh, AI technology is being deployed now to fold the proteins, uh, and through that technology you discover not only diseases but the cures that for things that don't even exist. You are engineering food in a lab. So this synthetic nature, uh, they are already preparing for the world where the, 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 there will be no food. They will give you some maybe powder tomorrow and you make with a little bit of water, you try to survive and who knows what's inside, right? So, uh, so if we are not making our own things, not relying on ourselves, then the solution that we will be given that are cheap will be very bad for us, right? 
And so this also is connected to that idea that you're saying financialization of our economy. F uh, financial economy is growing much more rapidly than the real economy. Our best minds, our best resources, everybody is focused on making the money, right? Apple, now, on, now they have their own credit card. You go to supermarket, they sell you insurance. Every app, they call it fintech, every app now wants to be fintech. Even when Elon Musk bought Twitter, he wants to make it into the, into the, into the payment company now, right? So everything is becoming a bank. You buy milk, oh, do you want to pay now, uh, buy now, pay later in installments. Everything is financial. So you have a situation where even the car company is making less money from producing car and more, car, more money from financing those cars. So fundamentally, that idea is capturing the world. Everybody, quick money. Let's make another cryptocurrency. But this one is FETVA approved, so it's, uh, give me your money. <laughs> you, know, uh, you know, everybody is making, oh, we need this money, this bank, this thing, this, this, this. Okay, make something real, make something tangible. So I think that's where the focus is. And, and in the hand of the uh, country, that has some ethics and moral norm. We enter moral economy. And this is a very critical part where this differs from capitalism, right? Because when certain capitalist or socialist country go to Africa, for example, they go to exploit, to rig the system, to bribe the politicians, you have devastating trail behind it. Look at Turkey. They go to Somalia. I have friends from Somalia. They go there, he was telling me, the delegation came, there were two warlords having the dispute. They brought negotiator who solved the problem between them. Some other maybe country bring the gun to one to solve it that way. You understand? But, you know, you go, Tika is doing so many great things around the world. And, you know, um, if you look at the Turkey from four million refugees to opening the embassies in, uh, in, in, in Africa to uh, f finance and sponsor so many humanitarian programs, there is a humanitarian leadership. If this was done by any other country, if any other country hosted four million refugees, they would be every day celebrated on the front pages of the New York Times. You understand? But we have something strange in the world where everything is looked through the suspicious eyes and and that's how it is. But I believe that that moral side is very important that will cut this uh, exploitative crony other systems. And the world needs that kind of leadership. That's kind of a third way, economic leadership, like Yusuf alayhi salam, I call it. You know, who at the time fix his economic system that benefit everybody. You understand? So you have hundreds of countries looking for some leadership and cooperation. United Nations doesn't solve it. That's why you see, you know, that Turk house in New York, after they finish United Nations, they don't have any hope. They say, maybe, maybe we have here hope. <laughs> they go there. Because they know. Security Council, five, right? They can't agree. They are in war constantly. Permanent state of war between them. Like in Bosnia, three president. They can never agree on anything. Even the soccer club has a street president and basketball and n nothing. They can't agree on anything. So uh, the world needs like a third way, something that is more moral and ethical, fair. Give us a chance to cooperate. And, I, and, and this is where this kind of uh, movement, thinking through economy, through business, through diplomacy, could maybe bring better cooperation between those countries. Thing. Like my, my point is that I'm afraid that we are looking at Turkey as this is, the lo this is the only choice we have and it keeps us from imagining a better choice. So like, I think we should think if we have a blank page and we unleash our imagination, what could we have done with, like, of course, Islamic finance and all established and with, 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 the, with, with some sense of reality, fiqh al waqa and what can we do? Because if we only focus on the Turkey as an example or as the only choice or the only current solution, 
and we s s uh, like hold to it because if we let it go, we won't have anything else. It might keep us from getting to something much better. I'm not saying the Turkish example, but it is that's it. That's it. Just Turkish becoming another China. And yeah. 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 It's it it, it is Tur Turkey for any country should be just an example. Don't expect anybody. And in fact, we shouldn't have that attitude. Somebody should come and solve things for us, right? I think. We look at what can I learn from that, what can I implement. Uh, it's going to be a long journey. You can't fix that. It's a life mission. You say, you know, I'm 25, 9, or whatever. My life, you know, I want to fix something. I, wanna, I, my, I want my life to matter. Uh, it's, it's a dedication. You, decades of work for, for, for one thing that I can do. Make it better. Start something. Contribute to something. Um, you know, it's, it's not going to be short quick fix for sure. Question regarding olive investment that, that that we set up. It's um, so what that uh, it's it's like a fund that invests in Australian healthcare, and uh, health healthcare in Australia is the biggest industry that employs m most of the people. Uh, people uh, in Australia uh, they now live longer because a lot of chronic diseases that people used to die from are now treatable. So people generally live longer, but it's more expensive getting you know. So, uh, so it's ethical. It's something that works well with uh, with our, uh, you know, system of beliefs. Uh, and uh, why Olive? It was our marketing uh, manager. Uh, we first named it uh, Iman Investment, and then he said, "Don't make it like uh, everything in our space become Iman Ihsan." These words, like you, you make it something completely different. Easy, more easy to sort of remember, you know. Just like our logos, everybody always Islamic company, they put crescent, you know, crescent, and uh, so make it something different. Uh, and uh, and then he make the logo, and uh, in the logo he he make uh, like uh, some sort of a circle and uh, a gap which points to Mecca, uh, and this is where our values are from. And uh, olive also is is a tree that is very healthy, lives long. And this medicine itself, right? So, so this is why we choose that, uh, and and we want our faith to inspire what we do, our our actions. So that I hope that, and I know Mindanao, the, 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 the region. Uh, thank you so much. Uh, I would like to thank you first of all. Uh, my name is Abukar, and I'm from Somalia, and I'm a student here in Istanbul. I'm studying civil aviation. It's my last year. I would like to ask you one question. Two questions. The first one is like, uh, as you know, in the world now, uh, there is a matrix system. The big companies are ruling the world, like J.B. Morgan, uh, Rothschild, and Johnson Johnson. These companies, they are the biggest companies in the world, and they are ruling. What did you say, matrix? Matrix system. Oh, okay. Yeah. There is a lot of companies like IMF. Also, they are working with them. United Nations, as you, World Bank. Uh, if you want to build like a like infrastructure or like a build a railway or something and stuff, they say you need to have a like uh, every country they need a dollar. They need what? They need a finance a dollar. Right. So a dollar it depends on American. It's American currency, mm. and you can't buy anything from outside of your country. Uh, in order, like, how can we become independent from dollar? Yeah. Can we have a, a like a world that is not? dependent U.S. currency, yeah. the first one. 
The second new one is, like you said, uh, Germany, as you see now, Germany is the first country in Europe because of why they become, they are producing uh, value-added products. Uh, Mercedes, BMW, Audi, all these cars are produced in Germany. Uh, most of European countries, uh, if you know, like the chocolate, the cacao is produced in Africa, the, the raw materials. But with one kilo, you are buying from Africa one dollar. But 100 gram produced, like they make the added value, they are producing in Europe, and they are selling 100 gram, just $10. And one kilo, they buy one dollar. So in order to be like, how can we become a country that is producing value added products that we can make money? So that's all. Thank you so much. Look, uh, it's, 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 these, these questions are very big, big questions. The uh, problem of the dollarization which we touched on is that um, currently in the world, when it comes to U.S. dollar, that dominates the world. When, when the government, U.S. government, uh, practice something that they call quantitative easing, where they increase supply of money, usually what starts happening with this uh, money, it starts finding its place in developing and emerging economies. Right? Yes. Uh, when, when they start tightening, okay, when they start increasing interest rate and that money starts going back, it then causes shock in those economies where it landed because it starts going back. Yes. Right? So this movement, uh, quantitative easing and then tapering, these are cycles that shock the world. So dependence on dollar is very difficult because dollar is a bedrock of our financial system, right? Yeah. So financial payments are backed in the, you know, settlement is backed by dollars. So um, some countries, as you see, they start dealing with neighbor country in their own currencies, right? They swap, create, swap trade. Right. <coughs> swap trading. And some countries create their own uh, channels of communication to create... Uh, uh, channels like a SWIFT, uh, US SWIFT, they have their own, so Russia has its own, China, and, and so on. Uh, these are very hard things to remove yourself when you are a small player in the yeah, world. Yeah, right? uh, as you said previously, sorry for interrupting, some of like the underdeveloped countries, they don't have that much uh, finance or uh, strong economic system, like in Africa and other like Asian countries. So that's why they are always, they have to uh, take debt from IMF or World Bank. Okay, let's say, let's say that they have to take it. Uh, in the meantime, I will give everybody every excuse. They have to take it, they take. They and do also this, do that. You these know, countries, the problems... they always have a labor cost, and also they are not producing value-added products. That's the problem. So that's the problem. What do you do with that money? It pays the salaries of bureaucracies, it, and sometimes it comes with a string attached, not necessarily conspiracy theory links, you know, but it might say, oh, you have to do this and that, that will ensure that you return the money. It's not going to be necessarily good for you. They are just saying, okay, here's the money, but make sure this happens, right? They are doing the, maybe in the best intention to get their money back, but it might not be in your best interest, okay? So, so, so what do you want to do, as you mentioned? Uh, you have a raw product that somebody takes and makes much more money than you. Well, you see where the problem is. I mean, you have to start somewhere doing and competing in this, right? You have to start making your own product. Right? Take that, make your own chocolate. Why is the Swiss chocolate? Where is the cacao being grown in Swiss? Or Belgium chocolate. Where is their cacao coming from? They don't have it even. They right? Grow it, yeah. In the Alps of the Swiss, when they're skiing, there is somewhere cacao there. <laughs> Look, 
True. That's that's a, that's a look. You know, I uh, I have a lot of courses. I have a one course, leadership Islamic finance, where I discuss with the young people, and this is very common. You know, where do I get money? I have this brilliant idea, and this and that. And my philosophy is that first of all, you start. I mean, before I tell you something else about money, uh, something to maybe a little bit think differently about the money. But look, you start with what you have, right? You start with what you have. Maybe you can't now become Nestle, right? But you you say, all right, chocolate, all right. What do you study? Civilization. All right. So let's say you're studying food, for example, since the, that was, okay, how can I make something? How can I make something? I, I, I have um, in Melbourne, uh, one hour from me, there is a chocolatier, which is a place like a factory on the hill uh, in uh, Glen Valley called, where they have a little chocolate factory, right? And they set up the factory in glass from one side. You can see it. And then from the other side, it's a restaurant, right? So you're sitting there, you're watching chocolate being made, right? And on the other side, you see beautiful green. And you're sipping the coffee, have a chocolate, you understand? And it's so popular, everybody going there, right? Uh, you make whatever you can. Uh, they make a chocolates with a picture of Australia and region. It became almost like souvenir, 10 times more the price, right? And people are buying it. They make little mugs, little, you know, bunny from that chocolate or whatever, you, you understand? So if you want to make chocolate, just start with something. Make your own unique flavor. Today, era of e-commerce, where you can sell authentic flavor, right? Uh, so, so you start with what you have, and then you grow it. Don't think about, I want to conquer the world. Just say, I want to make good chocolate. I want to sell it, and, 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 and take it step by step. What's, what will start happening? And this is what happened with us. You see, a lot of people think that the problem that they are not succeeding, there is no money. But money is the follower. Money is not going to lead ideas. It, it's not like money and ideas follow. No. Idea lead, money follows. But you need to execute some of it. More you execute, more money will follow. So when we started our fund, right, as soon as we started, we figured out in those medical clinics where we were investing, that the problem will be that people cannot visit doctors. So our business model, we just invested in clinics, and we can't get people to go in the clinics. How do we do it? We sit together, and we were brainstorming. How do we make something? Ta -da, you know, you know, you know, Uber. You know, uh, you know, Uber is a company that doesn't have any car yet. It runs the biggest taxi service. Right? How can we make something of the healthcare? And then we started telehealth, which is through the apps that you see the doctor. Mobile. Mobile, right? And so we integrated, find that system. How do we do that? Well, we have this app, then they call secretary, the booking comes, and they get SMS, then they connect them, and da 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 da. Telehealth was born. That accounted immediately for about half of our patients visit through that uh, app, telehealth, right? So I was talking with one uh, big fund manager from Malaysia, and uh, she was appointed chairman of that big fund. Uh, so I was saying, you know, like this, this is what we're doing, you know, and a few other things. She says, is there a way for us to invest in that? You see, money is chasing ideas. As soon as you can prove your ideas, even at the little scale, I said I don't need money, honestly, to be honest. I, I'm, we are growing slowly. You know, I, I, I can't take too much money. I don't know what to do with it. We're just trying to grow it. It's a long term, you know. Uh, but thank you very much. Maybe once we reach certain scale, um, you know, maybe we can talk about it. She says, okay, let us create a WhatsApp group with my advisors, and, you know, if you have anything, you know. And for me, I always tell that example because it shows me that if you can do something and do it and show it and run with that and advertise it, talk about it, 
then slowly, 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 maybe not even our project we thought, you know, this is 10, 15 years. Project. <coughs> I want in 15 years this to happen. So I don't want to even take money now, even, you know, this could speed up, but maybe I would compromise on something else, right? So don't expect immediately, where's the money? Somebody will give them. People will not just give money because of somebody's got the idea. Idea is not valuable commodity. There's a lot of ideas. You know, what's valuable you actually believing in that idea yourself and somehow put something behind that idea so that somebody can see, well, that, that there is a concept, that there is something that is beginning to work here, right? And so if we start doing that and slowly, I'll give you an idea. I was thinking the other day about Palestine, right? I saw this for some reason. I'm getting on Facebook ads from Israel, right? There was this company uh, in Israel. What they do, they are to support the settlers, right? There is a company that every year you pay, let's say, $100. And they go to the settlers who, by their own hands, make things. Bracelet, soap from olive, something like that, right? From their own work. Very low level manual work, right? They take every year, every month, five, right? They package and send you to US. And you support, they run a business, plus they support those settlers' business. I thought, wow, why nobody does that for Gaza, right? I would love to buy a liter of olive oil every month come from Gaza, even if it is 10 times more expensive. A little uh, something, something, you know, soap, zatar, I don't know, something. <laughs> I don't care. I don't care what it is, honestly. Okay. Sign me up, right? You understand? This small house chocolate from, imagine Gaza chocolate. Please, where do I sign up? You understand? So these kinds of things, idea, you know, you start slowly <coughs> developing, developing, and then you think about it, and then money will find, find you, believe me. There is a money, but money is looking for idea to follow, for leaders. Money wants to follow leaders' ideas. I want to ask you one more question about uh, the bankrupt, the bankrupt of the, like most of government is, uh, there is a credit rating system mm -hmm. when the government cannot pay their loans. So they will have a like, uh, bad credit, credit uh, rating. So they will not be able to get any loans from outside their country. So maybe other countries, maybe international uh, hedges or foundation companies, they will not give anymore. So I want to ask you one question. How the government is financed their uh, economic system? Like whether it is housing, like uh, normal economy, and also the credits, uh, this is stuff, how the government, how the governments finance their economic system? In many ways, uh, all of that, what you mentioned. Um, uh, one great way, for example, that Turkey has done is through public-private partnership, which will be very critical, especially now after earthquake. I estimate the cost, first day when it happened, I said it will be $100 billion at least. UN came with estimate yesterday, I think $100 billion. So, I said to some of my friends, journalists, I said, you know, uh, current government build infrastructure in very innovative way, yeah. which is public-private partnership. And you, there is no way without that that you will find out. In the last 20 years, Turkish government, they invested their money, all of them in real estate or uh, maybe in Not just in real estate, but they were, that was a significant composition of their uh, growth, like building real things, infrastructure and so on. So they... Um, government uh, uh, and private sector working together. And that's also fit with Islamic finance. Let's say I want to build a road. All right, bring the company, let them build the road, put the tolls on that road, and tell them you can collect the tolls for next 25 years, after which the ownership of the road reverts back to the government. As a government, you didn't build, you didn't, it didn't cost you anything. Somebody build economic activity, jobs, taxation, all of that you get, right? And you get uh, infrastructure uh, that, that, that your economy need. Okay, so, so being innovative with the way you finance and uh, leverage uh, 
that, I think that's that's how it is. Now, in terms of the credit worthiness, all of these things, of course, you need to have a disciplined fiscal policies, and the government needs to be trusted to do what to cooperate. But uh, some solid projects can be done in many of the countries with a bit of an innovative way of financing. Okay, thank you so much. Yeah, there is a question from a participant joining online. Uh, yeah. <clears throat> what are your thoughts on cases where local produce is exported because sellers can earn more from that than from selling it locally, hence resulting in a deficit in local supply and the need to import to meet the deficit? What could be a solution to that? Uh, if, if they are... Uh, this is unfortunate market dynamics, yes? So what he is asking is that if you are producing something and it's more profitable to export to foreign market than to domestic, how do you fix that, right? Uh, that, that is a challenge, you know, the market dynamics like that, they, they, are, they are bound to happen. You know, in Australia, for example, we had a problem with the baby milk. Uh, where um, one of the Chinese company, they, 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 they baby milk end up poisoning a child, and then they actually, I think, executed the executives. <laughs> that was a punishment. <laughs> so everybody, uh, so China, in terms of the baby milk, they are scared to use their own local. They don't know the quality, right? So what they end up doing, they start buying from Australia. Now, Australia put a kind of a ban of some sort. But what they do, they, they do like an Uber kind of. They, they go to the students and say, you go for me to the shop, buy the bot bags of that, send me with the courier. So it's sort of black market develops, you know. So now we don't know. We, we, don't, have, we don't have now the <laughs> baby milk powder. Um, these, are, these are the tough ones, you know. I, I, I don't have on top of my head. Uh, I would say that uh, what, what ha tends to happen is in these cir circumstances, if this is really profitable area and you can expand your capacity, right? If, if, you, if, you, if you find that people are really um, uh, making profit, that this will send a signal hopefully in the market that will attract more investments and more people who go into that. Uh, it, if there is a situation where it endangers strategic supplies of one country, then perhaps government could interfere. You know, like for example, let's say you export all of Australia, start exporting all milk to some other country. I would say no, you have to keep 50% here, you can export 50%, you know, because at the end of the day, they, there, is, there is essential need that you might need to regulate, you know. So that, yeah, yeah, that's good. Okay, my name is Sherindra. Uh, I am Indonesian. Now I'm studying Islamic economy and finance here. Uh, my question is, like you mentioned, uh, the Turkey that they will not increase the interest rate, and I heard that maybe in the long term uh, they will make it even into zero interest rate. I heard something like that. Like, uh, what do you think about that idea that make a country become a zero interest rate? Is that possible, or like how? Yeah, zero interest rate. Look, I mean, um, I mean, the question is related to the economic system. Like, wh when we say zero interest rate, are, are we talking about there will be some sort of uh, Islamic economic principles, or how does that work? Because if you look at last couple of decades, U.S., Australia, most of these countries, their interest rates were virtually zero. Before pandemic, they were zero point like twenty five. They were virtually zero. In fact, uh, you, you could have read that many of the interest rates were in negative interest rates even, right? So, so a central bank use these tools. They have a mandate uh, that manage certain things inside the economy with this, with this lever. I think uh, I'm not so concerned about will it be zero or lower or high because this is a system central bank will, will play with these things. Uh, we would like it to go to zero. And, but idea is also that uh, conventionally, conventionally, 
central bank used to be so independent that they thought, and they have only one tool to manage economy. Uh, you know that uh, saying, if the only tool you have a, is a hammer, everything looks like a nail? So this is a central bank. So the only tool they have for fixing economy is bang, you know, interest rate. But economy is complex, right? You can't just hit one side in the economy and hope everything gets fixed. So I think what, what, what more likely is going to happen here is that we are probably going towards the system where just like government uh, is interfering with domestic, uh, foreign affairs and, you know, like what's happening uh, with policies, it will have to have some kind of input in the monetary policies so that to make sure that if I'm doing something in the economy and I'm elected and I appoint these guys, if I'm having a strategy to execute, you as a central bank should follow me. I understand in the West it's sort of independence and everything, but you could end up with a situation where what you are doing is, is in, with the odds with your monetary policy. So I think it makes sense for people who are chosen to lead the country with a specific vision that everybody falls in line from government department and follow and execute that vision, and then you compete. Let's see, let's see, let's see, let's see uh, who, who does that better. You know. Okay, I think uh, the lecture tonight was very informative, thought provoking. I think we have uh, started from globalization, regionalization, till the Turkey case study, and ended with some ideas regarding how it, we finance small business and entrepreneurship and these ideas. So I think it was a large scope, but it was interesting. Thank you for lecture, and I hope, I hope we can uh, meet again in another lecture. Thank you so much. Thank, Thank you, you for everybody. attending the lecture. Thank, Thank you. you very much.